Thank you, Earl. I did think it was like one of the girls looked a bit pink from here. So it's someone's water bottle, but thank you. <laughs> ah, that's, I trust you. It's good to be at this vantage point. On the one hand, it doesn't feel good because it feels elevated and separated, and it's certainly nothing that we aspire to at all at CityGate is that any one of us who preach from here are any, any bit elevated at all from each one of you. We are here as fragile, broken, and many times faulty human beings that just love Jesus and appreciate that he pours his gold, he pours his spirit into our very cracked and fragile souls, and in that he makes us strong. I really mean that, but it is so that we can actually see at the back there, which is great, um, just so we can connect. And also in faith, we trust that God will explode this family of ours as we make space for him, and in our hearts we make space for others to come to know him. And I trust you feel the, the grace and faith to share and invite your friends and others into, honestly, a very special space. And so we're so encouraging again to get a message from someone who's been part of us who just appreciates the transformation that happened in such a short time in their lives. And I've often said one moment, one set of, we've said this as elders, one moment in City Gate Church, whether it be at celebration service, whether it be at a home group, whether it be at a prayer meeting, and I trust as we start to share coffees and meals together on a more regular, regular basis, one moment in his presence will change your life forever. You don't need to be here for a long time. We just, you can meet with God in a moment. He's a God that can change your life in a moment. I remember once having a short time in my morning devotion, in my morning time with Jesus, I literally had five minutes and I thought, well, just five minutes, that, let me just leave it and carry on and carry on with my day. And I was staggered that in the five minutes I took in the first paragraph and the first sentence of the word of God I read, it hit me straight into my solar plexus and I, I, was, I didn't need to go any further. I didn't need to go any further because that, the word penetrated my heart and, and shifted my revelation and shifted something in me to look and to act in a way that I'd never done before. So you do not need hours and hours in his presence. He can move and change you in a moment. But it also doesn't mean that we spend hours and hours in his presence. So we are finishing and we feel by faith to finish the series on spiritual war. It was birthed out of the end of Joshua where, where just reading Joshua, I, I just sensed that actually it's a book that taught us how to fight. And as we kind of realized that and, and double clicked on that in a sense, we just thought to take a season out where we would preach into spiritual warfare and the reality of that. And today I just want to finish that and, and tie it up and conclude it. There's never really a conclusion to these things because it's a never-ending grace of revelation as we continue to walk with God. But, but let's, we, we're going we're gonna to finish up this kind of mini-series on spiritual warfare today. You know, I've been uh, writing a, a book for, it really started for my son, um, because I couldn't find anything that I really enjoyed that spoke to a 13-year-old. And, and I kind of had this idea in my mind, what do I wish I knew when I was 13 years old? And so I started writing, and uh, I'm kind of in my second draft and as I'm reading through it again. But when I came to the title of this book, I titled it Preparing for War, which is quite a like, radical title in many ways. But ultimately, I, I feel as a 13-year-old as a boy going into this, and it doesn't matter 13-year-old boy or, or girl or a new believer, it doesn't matter where you are, but the reality is 
that there comes a time in your life where you realize that you are at war. I'm not sure the world realizes it, although I'm very aware that the world sometimes articulates the truth of what we actually believe, sometimes even better than we do in their own ways. As I heard this morning when I was talking to a friend of mine, it's amazing how these skillful writers understand spiritual truth in the sense that they speak about it, but they don't even have the context of Jesus, so it's, it really is at 80, maybe 50% power. But the reality is, as a believer, and as we've been preaching about in the last season, we, my friends, are at war. And the moment that you get saved, the moment that you put your hand up, you become target number one. And as Jesus said, if they did this to me, they will absolutely do it to you. I have to remind my children, if they persecuted Jesus in the unfiltered environment of school, where you are still vulnerable and working yourself out in that space, it can be very ruthless for our children, where children are unrestrained in their abuse of one another, in their riddling of one another as they struggle with their own identities. And if they don't understand that they are at war, it's hard to fight. And so, my friends, we need to know that when we, if they did, if we follow Jesus, Satan did everything to kill Jesus, and he eventually did not outside of the sovereign will of God, but inside and with the sovereign will of God. Satan thought he had won until he realized he had nothing on Jesus because the, the difference about Jesus and the, and the reason why Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life is because there was no sin, darkness found on him. And so when he went down and he experienced death, it was only for three days. And when he stood before the courts of heaven and, and as, a, as, a, as a holy man, as the Lamb of God, perfect in every way, hell could not keep him down. And the Holy Spirit raised him up. And that, my friends, is our faith. That he dealt with our biggest problem by dying for us. And he's the only one that could because he was the lamb who had no blemish on him. And so when we surrender to Jesus, what we're actually doing is we're receiving his blood that cleanses us. We are. We are the righteousness of Christ. And so when the spiritual realm looks at us, because we are seated with Christ in heavenly realms, they see the spiritual realm, sees the blood of Jesus, sees the lamb that is without sin. And that's, my friends, why you have no condemnation. That's the reason you're worshiping here today. But I sense in the way we act, we don't fully get this. And so, I was thinking this morning as a practice in my own life, especially at times when I'm struggling to sleep, I start to play the story of the Bible in my mind. And I start, I start with where did it all begin? That's where I start the story. It starts in the spiritual realm. And it starts in the spiritual realm where, by faith, the Bible tells us there was a war. And if you, and I just want to say, and I don't think it's really applicable to this audience, but you have an audience with many people that don't believe this. But we need to understand right at the beginning of the story, whatever you're going to say in this space, if you're talking to anybody else, is by faith. Nobody can prove to you that this story is untrue the way, and, that, and, you, and you, can't, you can't prove, the, prove to them that they, the way they want you to prove to you. Okay, I'm, I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> I, had to, I had to tweet that, actually, because it's just, let's just leave it at this. Everybody in this world lives by faith. They might not want to acknowledge it, but they can't prove to you that what they're saying is right the way they want you to prove to them that what you're saying is right. So by faith in the spiritual realm, 
there was a war. God gave choice in the spiritual realm because God is a God of love. And Satan and his angels, 30% of them, rebelled against God, which meant that they chose to be divided from God. It meant that Satan didn't want to live in a relationship of love and harmony and peace. He wanted to be God and in control of his band of angels, which meant that there was a separation in the spiritual realm. And that, my friends, is the genesis of the war that we are talking about. And you cannot read the whole of the Bible without many references to the reality of a realm that we can't see of angels and demons that are fighting on our behalf, involved in a war that we cannot see. But it is very real. And yet in that space, God still said, I want to start a family. Despite the reality that I know in the freedom of choice that there's an opportunity for people, because I'm a God of love and give a choice, there's an opportunity for people to rebel. Satan will never be redeemed because he has seen God in his glory. He is so arrogant that in seeing God in all of his creative power, he still chose to rebel. That's how arrogant he is. He will never live by faith because to live by faith means that you to believe in something that you haven't seen. That's why Satan is irredeemable. And just know that, that your enemy, because he is irredeemable, is ruthless, merciless. He hates you. And the only reason he'll parade as an angel of light, as if he's good, is only to absolutely murder and destroy you at the first opportunity he has. But he is only, but he is restrained by God. And so this morning, I want to speak about this thing of spiritual warfare. And where I want to land, and I need to say this now, otherwise I feel like I'm not going to land, is that we've spoken through Ephesians, we've spoken through the reality of this war, there's reality of demons and that want to destroy us under Satan's rule of the world. But we have another enemy, which I want to highlight this morning. And it's an enemy I feel we haven't spoken about. And that enemy is your flesh. Sometimes our worst enemies are ourselves. And that's where I want to land. And we need to learn to restrain ourselves. Sometimes we keep on blaming the devil for a whole lot of things that you keep doing because you've been so enmeshed in the world and the worldly ways that when God says and invites you to transform your thinking, you keep on thinking and you are so deceived into thinking the wrong ways. And so you remain stuck and you remain going round the mountain, blaming the devil sometimes who seems far more big than actually God is because only God is omnipotent omnipresent omniscient the devil is a created being that you sometimes blame for your own flesh that actually doesn't want to surrender to Jesus And so I tell the story in my mind. From the beginning, in the spiritual realm, there was a war. God still wanted to have his family. And so he created Adam and Eve. He created this planet. And he said, this is a perfect planet for me to now multiply myself, just as a husband and a wife come together, and they multiply themselves in an intimate, passionate lovemaking. So God multiplied himself. He put us in a garden, giving us a choice. And we know the story, but I say the story again. Satan came and said, did God really say? And so Adam and Eve failed the test. They were deceived into thinking 
that all knowledge of life and death is better than trusting God and trusting God's word over them is do not eat of that fruit. And they ate of the fruit and they became naked and ashamed. And my friends, that reality is our reality. We are all descended from Adam and Eve. And all of us have sinned. And all of us have sin inside of us. Which manifests in a flesh that will not do and chooses by our mind not to obey Jesus. And when I was preparing this, I thought, why am I sharing the same story again? Because I share this all the time. But I feel I want to say I have an expectation on each of you, not for any other reason. Then I absolutely believe this is good for you and it's right for you. And I honor you in saying this because of who you are. My friends, I did not go to theological college. I did not become a full-time minister to know every single story of the Bible. I can recount the stories of the Bible as I sleep one after the other simply because of time and hunger, but time and hunger still in the marketplace, still with children, still with leading a, I trust, a full life. And so when I was sitting with the youth on Friday, I said, hey, do you guys know the story of Jephthah? One of the guys was saying, no, he doesn't, he doesn't, he hasn't spent much time in the Old Testament. I said, do you know what you're missing? Do you know the story of Jephthah? Who knows the story of Jephthah? Who doesn't know the story of Jephthah? I'm only saying this, my friends, because I honor you, eh? I honor you because you are the ministers. My job and Christoph's job and Derek's job is to equip you for works of ministry. If you're going to go out there and fight, you need to know your sword. Otherwise, you're going to get slain. When these guys go out into the playgrounds, they are vulnerable to be slain if they do not know how to wield their sword. There are stories, every single story in this this Bible will help you, shape you, become an expert swordsman so you can resist the enemy. Japhta was an illegitimate child. In other words, he was born out of wedlock. He was, some might say, a bastard child, rejected by his brothers. And you can read about him in the book of Judges. But he was a fighter. He probably fought all his life. He was a survivor. And because he had to fight all his life, he was obviously ruthless and good at fighting. And because Israel kept on disobeying God, God always says, I'm going to put people around you to test you. My friends, he will put people around you to test you. To test what you actually believe. That's not because he's a bad God, it's because he's a good God. He wants you to know what's inside of you. And so he put tests around. The Midianites were a test put next to Israel. And when Israel decided that they no longer wanted to worship God and do his ways, he said, fine. If you don't want to worship me and you're worshiping the gods that other people worship, I put you into the hands of those people's gods. And so what that meant is the Midianites would come and steal their blessing. And so in these times that Israel kept on doing it, they would then cry out, we need a hero. We need someone to come and rescue us. Japhta, he's a tough guy. Japhta, come and rescue us. The bastard son, come and rescue us. The one who's illegitimate, come and rescue us. We're so desperate. And so Japhta came and he fought. But Japhta did a silly thing. Because when you are not governed and restrained in your mouth, you can say some silly things. And so Japhta made a vow to God. He said, God, if you help me win this battle, and make me famous so that I will be judge of Israel and have all the blessings that come with that. If you will do that, the first thing that comes out of my house, I will sacrifice to you. And he won the battle. What was the first thing that came out of his house? His one and only daughter. 
And it wasn't like, hey, oh, no, no, it was just a silly uh, prayer. That was a silly vow. He had to follow through with, with the vow he made before Jesus. And so that young girl, that virgin girl, went for two weeks and mourned with her friends that she would never experience the joy of marriage and children because her father was going to sacrifice her, and he did. And she's a picture of what Jesus did for us. You can find Jesus on every page of the Bible. You can find every reason to start restraining yourself when you get filled with the word. My friends, my expectation for you is that you know every word of this Bible. It's my expectation. And so I said to myself this morning, why am I telling the story again? Because it's a good story. It's a story that I need to remind myself again and again because of the fight, because of the, the war that we are in. See, I have lots of notes here, but it's like in, in light of that prayer meeting, in light of the song of the Titanic, I can say lots of things, but I almost have faith to just ask you to have the courage to maybe deal with something that you are holding on to. Because I, I think this, my friends, is the reality of this war that we speak about, the spiritual war that many people can say many things about. And in my own experience, I've seen how people, knowing that there's a spiritual realm that you can't see, often blame that realm for your life circumstance rather than acknowledging that you are still very worldly. I can only say that because I've realized that with my own self. When Jesus went up the mountain tempted by Satan, and Satan came to tempt him, he said to Jesus, see all of that, everything that you can see, that's mine, and I can give it to you. And Jesus said, knowing he made everything, accepting the reality that it's only his, Satan's, because his own children have given Satan that authority. But Jesus said, no, but he worships the living God. And so I think I want to invite you to perhaps think a little bit differently when, it, when we speak about spiritual warfare. Do not give the enemy more credit than he's due. The enemy is unseen. He does live in a heavenly realm and he has been given supernatural power. So when we try to fight the enemy on ourselves, by ourselves, we are, we are no match. But that's not how we fight him. We fight him in Christ. 
And because we fight him in Christ, the one who created everything, we are seated in Christ with him, and therefore that we have absolute power in the name of Jesus because Jesus created everything. And if we remain in Jesus, the enemy cannot do anything to you. So if that is true and you are still struggling with things, my friends, the enemy is not omnipotent. He is not omnipresent. In other words, he's not all-powerful and he's not everywhere at all, all at once. Only God is that. He's also not omniscient, which means he knows all things. Only God, God knows all things. Which leaves one thing left. We have, by the choices and by our bloodline, been enmeshed in the world. The world has become part of us. It doesn't mean you're bad. It just means that is the reality, my friends. The way you think, the way you act, the way you respond has been fashioned by the reality that you, from a child, have been born up in worldly ways. And Jesus comes and he invites you to start thinking differently. To start restraining yourself. To, to start bringing every, every word and every deed and everything you do under his government. Which means that that's everything. It's not some things, it's everything. In Romans 7, 15 to 20 it says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do. And if I do not do what I want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know, that, I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have a desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that's living in me. Paul is explaining this dilemma we have that we keep on doing the things that we shouldn't be doing. And then he goes on to say, but for the grace of Jesus, but for the power of the blood that rescues me and covers me and his grace comes over me, I'm able to stand against the sin that is inside of me that keeps me wanting to will and to act in a way that is not in line with God's ways. So how do we fight? How do we live a restrained life? My friends, the reason the enemy is not taking every person out in this world is because of the preaching of the gospel. This is, it's out of the preaching of our gospel, it restrains the evil one. When we are standing up here at City Gate in this area, we are speaking against the evil that is all around that wants to consume this area with poverty and drugs and alcohol and every other single false religion and false identity and false form of satisfaction. And I've said it many times that sin is filling, fulfilling an, a legitimate desire, a legitimate need with illegitimate means. God has made us to need him. He's made us to be satisfied by him. And while I was saying that what the world does, as I looked in the airplane and watched every single person playing games on the plane, the world is an expert and the devil who is in control of the world will do everything to distract us from facing the reality that we are going down. And so he's a master of distraction. He'll distract us with false religion. He'll distract us with too much sport. He will distract us with every single entertainment. And this is good. Like, I'm not saying sport is bad. I'm not saying entertainment is bad. But when that becomes an idol, when that becomes a distraction, and we don't know the stories of the Bible, my friends, you're on a slippery slope. You are just falling prey to the devil of distraction that's stopping you Standing out and being holy and separate and creating a life that's an alternative to the life the devil is leading all of us into and wants to lead us into. We are people that keep on sitting on the grandstand. When you watch TV, the TV is telling you the vision instead of you telling the TV the vision. The problem with television is it tells you the vision. We are people to be visionary people. 
We are people that say, my friends, there's something in my heart for the youth at this time. It's a, real, it's a counter reality to every single entertainment that's happening. We have to think of creative ways for these guys to encounter life and abundance without having to go onto a device. They cannot talk to each other because they're always on a cell phone. It's a problem. It's another trap of the devil. And if we don't take charge of our life and start restraining this entertainment against us, we are going to lose and go down a slope of distraction. So how do we fight? We live a restrained life in Romans 12 by sacrifice, by humility, and by action. We live, we fight by sacrifice, we fight in humility, and we fight by action. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, I'm reading, reading from Romans 12, in view of God's mercy, to offer the bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. My friends, I'm not going to exegete this whole story here, but I want to say this. You can test God. I said it in the, in the, in, as we were giving our money to worship. I said it to the youth. In, in money, he invites you to test him. There is a life that we can live that is far more beautiful than the life the world and the devil is trying to portray, and we can even test him, test him on that. But it's a life that's counter everything we know. It's a life of sacrifice. And we spoke about it at the men's meeting on Monday night. Earl came up, and he's, he has a revelation. Earl, where are you gone? He has a revelation that he has been called to serve. He has a revelation that joy gets released when he stops thinking about himself, and he sacrifices himself for others. We live a life of sacrifice. It's counter the world. The world does not want to know about self-sacrifice. The world is all about me, I, and what I can get out of things. Counter. We fight by sacrificing ourselves in faith and doing what Jesus did and experiencing, and you can test him on this. I want to say to you, I, I will guarantee you that you start, stop thinking about yourself and you start serving at every opportunity. If you will have joy, I, I put my head on it, you will experience joy. It says, be humble, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed each of you. For, each as, for just as each of us has, has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We are different. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If, it's, if, if it is in giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. My friends, we need each other. This is not the Mark show, Christoph show, Derek show. This is our show. Each of you has an amazing gift. I, do, I cannot do everything. I don't want to do everything. I'm freed up to be me. you freed up to be you. But, but that's humility. It's in humility that we need each other. And when you're in a big family, like, like you know, Carol, I don't know if this is um, what God wants to say right now, but but we need you. So it's as you, as you just remind your husband there, we desperately need you. We're not actually desperate because we have God, but we need you. My friends, we need, Cliff, we need you to stand up. I know the prophecy. I've prophesied of you, Cliff, going to dangerous places. I'm not prophesying that you are a main guy that's better than everyone, no, and neither am I. But there are things that you can do that I cannot do, Cliff. We need you to be Cliff. We need you to walk into the, into the plan that God has for your life. I can't do that for you, Cliff. All I can do is, give you, is celebrate and look and be inspired by what God is doing with you. And my friend, that is honoring you. 
That's why I say, when I say know the Bible, do you think, why, why am I saying that? I'm saying that because I know when you know the Bible, you're an awesome swordsman. And I'm just gonna say, wow, I'm inspired by what God is doing with you. And the last thing is we are people of action. We are not people that just come sit and talk. We are people of action. Love is action. Love is a doing word. The opposite of love is being lazy, as my one gym instructor used to say to us. Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. My friends, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with the people of low position. Do not be conceited. My friend, God hates pride. Do not repay. Listen to this. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. We are not people that need to be revengeful. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. This is not to mock. This is to all of us. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And of course it's to me as well. And if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live in peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. As it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's how we fight. We're going to take communion now. Whatever this means to you, my friends, there's something on this song. As Christoph plays, I just trust. I trust for myself that I can have the courage to ask maybe a question that I've never asked before. That in pursuit of this life and the goodness of God, that I'm prepared to leave everything that I know and I control so that I can honestly say I have everything of God. You know what's interesting in that scripture? I was thinking this weekend, you know, there are many attractive things in this world. There are many beautiful places. There are many beautiful things you can own, whether it be sports cars. In fact, I was talking to a, a worldly man this week who's owned sports cars. He said, I just love collecting things. He's obviously a man with a huge amount of wealth. He said, I collected sports cars, but I never drove them. <laughs> so he stopped collecting sports cars. He said, he was a gunsman, he collected guns. He said at one point he had the biggest gun collection in North America, in Canada. But he said, then he thought if he dies, his wife's gonna have to get rid of all these guns. So he got rid of, rid of all these. I mean, he's a good, he's, I think he's trying to be a good guy. Now he says he's, He's got a scotch whiskey collection. <laughs> but, but he says, I don't drink. But he says, I like to give it to my friends. The point is, my friends, he has a man with considerable wealth. He can get anything, but nothing satisfies him. The only thing that will satisfy us is adding the sense that our hands, our life is in the hands of a living God. And you know what it is? It's doing what you're gifted to do. It's doing what you're called to do, my friends. That's it. That's what we want at City Gate. That's the, that's the preach we're saying. I want you, Vessel and Carol, to be who God made you to be. Elizabeth, to be who, uh, to who God made you to be. That's it. And when you are doing what, and if this place is about honesty, this microphone, we'll never, ever walk into what God's called us to, to be. It's not about this microphone. 
It's about being inspired by what God is doing down the south coast, Albert. It's been inspired by the fact that he's going to heal cancer across the south coast. I'm saying, I'm inspired by a man's faith being called by God to bring healing. It's been inspired by Marianne who in a, in a different chapter of her life says, I'm going to, this chapter is going to be a beautiful chapter. This chapter is going to look different. This chapter is going to be painful, but it's in the pain and there's going to be joy. It's out of the depth of the pain. It's going to be joy that I never even experienced. And I get to share that with you just by simply knowing your story. And so perhaps I'm saying this, that the secret to spiritual warfare is getting on mission for God. The secret to winning this war is to go and be on a fence, to start taking ground, my friends. Because when you start to fight for Jesus, when you start to take responsibility in whatever that looks like for you, and please hear me, you're never too old, you're never too young. Sammy, never too young, my boy, to fight. Christoph's going to play. We're going to take communion. God bless you guys. If you feel like you want to do some business with God, if you feel like you need to seal something in the spiritual realm that's happened to you as we've been worshiping today, you feel in faith, you want others to come around you and seal something in the spirit, then by all means, come to the front. God bless you.